Thank you so much for being here, Stephen. It is absolutely my pleasure. I love what you do, Estelle. I think it's great. I was a little bit thrilled when you invited me on. I was a little bit like a fanboy. So well, I can go and be with the grown-up history people now. You know, I love that. It's my favourite thing. <laughs> <laughs> way too nice honestly i'm the fun girl so like it's so funny yeah. but <laughs> Stephen, you love history you champion yeah. history yeah you go to history festivals but you yeah. champion historians yeah can you tell me where does it come from this love for history you know it, when i was a child um I, like many British kids, certainly, you usually had to choose options when you were 14 years old between geography and history, which I always thought was really cruel. So two of those, of those great humanities subjects, you had to choose one or the other. I don't know why it always felt that way. And of course, I'm one of those classic kids who I was slightly cleverer at geography, and I chose geography, and literally from the time I did, I regretted it. Um, and I'm one of those people who went on and became, I became an actor from when I was only 19 years old. I've gone on, I've studied science, my academic background is science communication, but I have literally never left history behind. And it was one of those loves of my life. Uh, but in a way, it's been beautiful because what I've done all the way through my life is I'm an avid reader and I will tend to read uh, fiction, 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 then it will always be a history book, then something else, then another history book. So I've read history. I've been interested in history for a long, long time. You know, and because we still are, are affected and stamped with our history, we can't escape it. We, and that's why we must know it. We can't escape from it. I, I totally agree with you. Mm. I think that's why you, you're so good and called the midwife. Mm. More recent history, but it's something that touches our lives. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. can you tell me, like, what you yeah. think about? Because now you've done it for how many years? Thirty. This is, a, and we're on our thirteenth series at the moment, which amazes us. We didn't really believe the enduring and global success of it. So, what's been very interesting about Call the Midwife is it's it, it was this little show which nobody really gave much that much hope for. To be honest, it seemed a niche show to people and they didn't think it, but it touched a huge nerve with people, became immensely popular very quickly in Great Britain, long story very short, and then trotted off around the world and it has a very large following around, around the planet. So it's in its 13th year. Each year it covers one year of um, British history. Um, it always moves in real time. It's not a sort of a downturn in the sense that you, you get a vague sense of its period. It's a very specific period. And each year we draw upon <clears throat> actual historical, factual and medical details from that year of history in that place and time. So it's, it's quite specific. Um, the great historical, one of the biggest historical benefits um, of Call the Midwife is the period, the, the, the extent of its recency, the idea that it's largely living history and what it does in a social history way is it shows people more than ever in their structures and society, one, how we got to here. If something was a Victorian innovation, for instance, our railways and the arguments in Britain at the moment about railway expansion. I mean, there's a lot of Victorian roots to that and about the, you know, our sewerage systems and everything were built essentially by the Victorians. So there's a lot of interesting Victorian resonances. But when you take a National Health Service formed after the Second World War, when you cover a period of history which began in 1957 and we're currently filming 1969, that as a period of British history is one of the most seismic periods of social change, of medical change and challenge. Um, let me just pick things out of, out of the air that most of them we've covered, some of them we haven't yet. 
um, the legalization of homosexuality happened in the early 60s. The first medical scandal, huge pharmaceutical scandal with the, the thalidomide scandal. You have um, the abortion bill, the abortion act, so the legalization of abortion. Um, later on, it's the, the death penalties repealed. Um, these are huge decisions which society is making. And when we began... It was a society which was recovering. It was still going under a period sort of post-austerity. It was barely out of rationing when we began. It was a, a period in the East End where there were, there were rubble and bomb sites were still unbuilt on. So you had large periods of waste, large areas of waste ground. The Second World War was still an open wound. And the recovery from that was still an open wound. So, but in the middle of this, there was um, Clement Attlee's promise of a new world from cradle to grave, this promise of a new Britain. And it was a, it was a society rising. So we followed all the way through that to um, Harold Wilson, Prime Minister's white heat of technology in the late 60s. We've, we've covered the, England winning the World Cup in 66. There's some more, more wide social changes, but the hard social changes of women's roles all the way through. The pill came about in the early 60s, but access to the pill for ordinary working class women um, was still not clear right until the, the period we're covering now, because you had to go to a family planning clinic and you had, to, you had to be a married woman. You had to have the approval. So no, it wasn't freely available. So therefore, a program which focuses on uh, one of the central themes of being childbirth was actually a sort of Trojan horse for a much wider examination of what is a child, a child has a mother, then it's this woman's story of women and women's roles in the community at that time. Then a child is a family. Then it's how are families and how do they relate to their neighborhood. And then really, if you go broader and broader, it's who were we in the not so distant past? Why have we made the NHS we've made now? Why have we made the kind of Britain that we have now? Why are we unhappy with certain parts of it now? Who are we now? It, it doesn't, we, we, we don't run an agenda, but by looking at the 50s and 60s, we quickly found in this fascinating period that if you tell a story about Britain at this point, you're telling a story which is the first chapter of modern Britain in 2023. It's too recent. We, some of the, the ways government runs, some of the way we assume our world is, was very much rooted in there. I'll give one example, and it's particularly relating to women and women's history. A lot of young women watch it. Lots of people watch the program. Lots of men watch it too, as well as women. A lot of women have written to us, young women, and have been staggered at some of the things we show them about relative women's rights or even gay rights. Um, the they've I remember saying to one young woman, you know, she said, well, well what's this thing about this guy? He's been caught in a toilet in a, in a, you know, having a homosexual assignation and gets caught. And, they get... and another story we've told where someone is sentenced to um, to have chemical castration. And young women will write it. But that, that's ridiculous. That's so why would they do that? They've got no power to do that. So, well, it was illegal. I said, what do you mean it was illegal? I said, well, homosexuality was illegal. So why? And young women, young, intelligent, college-educated women, it would really surprise you, Estelle. There's, there's so much less sort of cultural memory taken on by further generations than we think. Basically, their memory is very, very short.